All right, let's uh, suppose you have been asked by your instructor to write a history paper and you know that you need some kind of uh, citations. Perhaps you've even been told that um, you need Chicago Turabian style citations. That's why I am here. Let's get going. We cite for three main reasons, so just a little background on this. First, for purposes of academic honesty. Each author owns their own words and ideas. You have to, uh, if you use those words and ideas, you have to say where you got them from so that they don't look like you are posing them as your own. That would be plagiarism, and that is an academic crime. The second principle is one that's common to all uh, reasoning endeavors that we want to share, and that is you have to be able to replicate your research. So in uh, academic matters, we don't play hide the ball with each other. We show how we got to where we got, and um, that is another reason why we cite. What should you cite? Um, this is often uh, a question that comes up in people's minds. Certainly, any quotations, paraphrasings, or arguments you want to cite. Quotations, of course, are those uh, phrases that you've taken directly from uh, others' writings. Paraphrasing happens when you take others' words and sort of translate them into your own. And then arguments, if you refer to the arguments of other people, you want to make sure that you cite those as well. You might be told that we don't need to cite common knowledge. Um, what is common knowledge, though? Um, elements of common knowledge are things that, that uh, over which there is absolutely no contest. Uh, nobody seriously argues that Abraham Lincoln did not win the presidential election of 1860, so that becomes common knowledge. If, if something is, is contestable, <clears throat> such as the fate of Amelia Earhart's airplane, that is something that is not common knowledge. So this is Amelia Earhart, who in 1937, I believe it was, flew solo, tried to fly solo across the Pacific and was never found. Uh, there are questions about whether she, uh, whether her airplane was found. There's still dispute over that. Um, so that is an, uh, something that is a debated fact. You would certainly need to cite that. If you are not sure whether you should cite something or not, it is probably good to err on the side of caution and cite. So this is your Bible, Kate Turabian's Manual for Writers. Um, Kate Turabian worked at the University of Chicago and um, what she did, she worked in the history department at the University of Chicago and she took the Chicago Manual of Style and kind of condensed it for uh, uh, college level students. Uh, this uh, book has been republished several times. It's currently in its eighth edition. This, if you are a, uh, a college writer who works in history, this is a must for you. If you are a history major, you should have this book. If you don't have this, then A Pocket Guide to Writing in History by Marilyn Rampola is a very suitable substitute. It's a little smaller and a little cheaper. It's not as comprehensive, but it relies on the Chicago Turabian format. You can also find uh, online style manuals. In fact, this Turabian style guide, uh, at least there's a quick version of it available online, and I've included the URL here at the bottom of the screen. You will certainly find others if you Google um, Turabian citation history, you will be sure to find many more. So let's take a look at um, footnote style. So this is um, just to kind of explain what footnotes are and, and, and how they're used. So here is just a page from a uh, journal. 
and uh, here is a footnote footnote number 10 in this little superscript here and this is going to be a citation that covers the previous sentence and in this case it'll probably cover the entire paragraph we have a short paragraph here of three sentences long and you'll see down here uh, at the bottom of the screen there's footnote 10 and that shows you uh, at least partially what the citation is uh, that is going to go into footnote number 10 so footnote number 10 here is going to contain the sources that are referenced in the sentence or paragraph uh, for footnote number 10 here okay Sometimes you will see endnotes, particularly in books. So in journal articles, you tend to see footnotes, and in books, you tend to see endnotes. Uh, often in books, you will get this um, special section at the end of the book where the endnotes are housed, uh, but they work almost exactly the same as footnotes. Just like with footnotes, you're going to run the numbers up from one sequentially upward. You restart at the beginning of a new chapter. That's not going to happen in a journal article, of course, but that is the uh, basic method that we're talking about here. Let's take a look at uh, some sample text. This is from a manuscript that I've been working on, and I, want, I just want to give you an example of what this looks like in, in your text. So here, there are three footnotes in this essay. Number 10 is here, number 11 here in the middle of the page, and then we're going to finish with number 12 down here. So we have three footnotes. Number 10 is going to reference the previous sentence. Uh, number 11 here is going to give us the source of this quotation, and the same with number 12. It's about one quotation. The, this is uh, the section of the endnotes from this manuscript. In our case, we're really concerned with footnotes number 10, 11, and 12, so I'll highlight them here. And essentially, this is very, very simple. I just want to make sure that it's exceptionally clear to everybody. We're going to take these footnotes, or these endnotes, are going to um, uh, be what is referenced in the text. So back here at footnote 10, this is what your endnote will look like all these sources here. This is an example of a citation with multiple sources. I'll talk more about that later on, but just to give you a sense that these footnotes can be, or I'm sorry, endnotes can become rather long. Here is the endnote for citation number 11, um, and this just gives me the source of that quotation. And the same thing with number 12. Here is the source of that one sentence quotation. Let's practice a little bit here. We'll try this. Uh, this is a book called Sweat and Blood, A History of U.S. Labor Unions by Gloria Skurczynski. So let us see what it would be like to try to create our own endnote. We're going to use, to build this endnote, we're going to use information on the book itself and the cover, the title page, the spine, the uh, obverse, the reverse page of the title page often has information that might look something like this and this will help you get the information you need to build your citation. You can also make, uh, use the information from an online uh, catalog to build a citation. This has most of what you will need, if not all. I recommend that if you have a project of any substantial size, uh, a project where you're using a dozen or more sources, I recommend that you create a bibliography card for each source that you use. You can do this um, virtually or use a fancy program like EndNote or ProSite, or you can really just go analog, go old school, and just have a 3 by 5 index card for uh, each bibliography citation that you have. And so each book or each work that you uh, consult is going to be listed in this bibliography. You're going to have uh, uh, the proper bibliographic citation on the card, and then you can have some other apparatus on the card, maybe uh, some kind of categorization that you make at the top, the call number on the card so you can easily refine a book if you have to return it to the library, maybe some keywords or other tags which helps you figure out what that source is best used for. All right, so let's take a look at a uh, typical Arabian endnote for a book. We are going to uh, use 
normal standard Times Roman 12 for this, the same way that uh, our paper font is going to be Times Roman 12, a nice, simple, clean serif font. Uh, we want to have our end or footnotes in the same font. If you can manage to get them into 10 point with your software, then that would be great. But uh, most instructors don't require this. We will populate the footnote here or the endnote with Gloria Skurczynski's book. And let's take a note at the elements of this form. First, we have the endnote number that is going to be indented one half inch. You're going to have half inch, or you're going to set your tab stops to one half inch. Uh, and then, of course, you'll have your one inch margin on the left and right and top and bottom of the paper. But make sure that this is indented in this fashion. If we were going to use the footnote form, it would look a little bit different. We would have this superscripted 8 here at the top, um, but we are just using endnotes here, and so it will look like this. Just wanted to give you a sense of what that footnote might look like. It's almost exactly the same. Your word processing software should be able to do this for you. It is your responsibility, of course, to understand your word processing software, whatever you're using. Most of us use Word, Microsoft Word, which is very, very standard. And uh, but it, it, you, you do want to be working sufficiently closely with your software that you can figure out how to do these things that you need to do. That's part of your responsibility. OK, we're going to have the author's name. This goes first name, then last name. Uh, in the bibliography form, it will be reversed, so don't mistake that here in the endnote or footnote form. First name, then last name. You do not have to put the surname first. Then we're going to have, after a comma, we're going to have the title. This is going to be italicized. You're going to, uh, regardless of how the title appears on the title page of the book, you are going to put the initial uh, letter of each word in capitals, except for those conjunctions and prepositions of five letters or fewer. Then we're going to have publication information coming. This is going to be in parentheses in a note, not in a bibliography. It'll be a little bit different. And you're going to have the city of publication and then the two letter state abbreviation unless it's obvious. Sometimes it's very obvious. If you have a New York University Press from New York City, you might not need NY in there as the state, but when in doubt, it's always best to put it in. And then you'll have the name of the press as it appears on the title page of the book or the reverse of the title page. And then you'll have the year of uh, publication, which will also come from the title page of the book. And then we finish with the page number. And you note here that we just have the number itself. We don't have any abbreviation of P period. We're just putting in the page number here. Okay, that was the form for a journal article. Now look, let's look at bibliography form for a book. We'll populate this with Gloria Skurczynski again here. Uh, some things to note. This is when we put the author's last name first, then the given name. We only do this in bibliographic citations, and we only do, do it to the first author in that citation. And we do that because we're going to alphabetize the, bibli the bibliography. OK, we're going to be single spacing this citation. We'll have a double space, extra hard return between citations, and we will order them in that way. Notice what uh, is going on here uh, with the indentation. This is called a hanging indent or back tab. Uh, do not just throw tab stops to make this work, because if anything changes in your paper, like font size or margins, or you're correcting misspellings, then those can get all thrown off. Instead, in Microsoft Word, what you want to do is highlight the entire citation, go under paragraph, and then you will look for, I think it's under special, hanging, uh, and it's called a hanging indent. So take note of that. We're going to have the book title in italics, um, just as we uh, did in the note form. We're going to put the city of publication. All that publication information is going to essentially look the same. It does not have, it's not in parentheses though. These are elements that are separated by a period. Uh, and then you're going to have the other publication information, name of press and date. Yeah, note 
that we're using periods rather than commas to separate separate elements of the citation here. <clears throat> uh, that is the one of the main differences between a bibliographic citation and a uh, and the note form. Okay, let's uh, look at uh, EndNote and bibliographic form uh, in uh, comparison with each other. So this is what a note might look like in your paper. Note 13 is Marilyn Hoskin. That is going to refer to this work in the bibliography. Uh, so here's how these notes uh, would look. And notice the punctuation here. This is the main difference. We're, uh, uh, end notes are, if this helps you understand this, great. If not, forget what I'm going to say. But end notes are sort of analogous to sentences where the uh, different elements are separated by commas. Um, bibliographic citations are analogous to paragraphs where the different elements are separated by periods, where each element of the citation is kind of analogous to a, to a sentence. So that's one of the ways that I keep these distinct in my mind. Let's uh, do the same thing for journal articles. We'll take a look at a journal article in uh, note form and then in bibliographic form. <clears throat> a reminder of how that punctuation is working. Uh, commas in, in the note form and periods in the bibliographic form. A few things to remember, uh, journal article titles go in quotation marks and journal titles go in italics. You want to carefully follow the model for the publication info, um, particularly on journal articles. You'll see volume number or volume abbreviated, number with a capital N, months abbreviated, commas inserted between months and years. Um, those are all incorrect for this form. Follow this model closely. And when you are separating pages, uh, page numbers in your citations, note here that the page number in journal articles and the note form is it goes comma and then the, the whatever page number that footnote is referencing. Okay, if it's more than one page number, you would include more than one page number. In the bibliographic form, what you're going to have is a colon and then the entire page range of that article. All right, let's look at how this, uh, how we would actually put these notes into our writing. So here's a little piece of writing uh, that I have. This is from my own work. <clears throat> I've got a paragraph with um, some primary source information. Uh, and now I want to footnote that. Okay, what we are going to have is our footnote number there. This will be footnote number seven <clears throat> or endnote number seven. <clears throat> that how, that's how it appears in the text. And then this is what the footnote is going to be uh, or endnote in this instance. And that'll be at the back of my document. And here that is a uh, a citation, a full citation for a newspaper article. Then I'm going to continue on with my paragraph. I have another bit of primary source information. That's going to be in footnote number eight. And that's what that looks like. Again, it's from a uh, historical newspaper. And then I'm going to have a last piece of here. In this instance, I'm not referencing or I'm not citing a uh, direct quotation. Instead, I'm citing some information. The sentence here, Georgia, Mississippi, South Carolina, and Texas all went so far as to enumerate the intentional incitement of servile insurrection among your justifications for secession. That is a statement I need to back up. I need to show that these uh, four states uh, actually spoke about the incitement of servile insurrection in their secession documents. And so I'm going to have a big footnote that does that work. And I'm going to have notice what's going on here. I've got uh, four different sources, one for Georgia, Mississippi, South Carolina, and Texas. And each of those uh, I am c connecting into one big footnote. 
there you can see the four distinct elements. They're all brought together with semicolons. And there are those semicolons that are uniting these things. That's how you put multiple citations into one footnote. And this is just to show you how um, a single note can combine many citations. Here in this paragraph, we've only got footnote 7 at the end, and we're going to put all three of those uh, footnotes into one single note. And this is what that would look like, as you can see at the top there. You've got what was footnote 7 joined with footnote 8 and footnote 9 into one big one. Okay, so a little bit uh, more advanced work here. <clears throat> if you want to do this a little bit more closely to the way the pros do it. Subsequent references. So here, our first note is to Marilyn Hoskin, page 21. And then let's say our uh, we're, we're the first time we cite a source, we're going to cite it fully. We have the full standard citation just the way I showed you, just the way we practiced. And now let's say footnote number two is a different guy. This is uh, a different scholar. This is Barry Rigby. Uh, and then footnote three is going to go back to Marilyn Hoskin. Notice what we do here. Now, since we have referenced it, given the full citation already in an earlier note, all we need to do is use the, quote, short form here. We just need the last name of the author, a short version of the title, and that will suffice. And then we have a different page number here, page 42. And then say Rigby is number four. Well, we can use the short for, form for his. Hoskin was a book, so you're seeing this, the book short form. And then Rigby is a journal article. You see the journal article short form. And then let's say footnote five is Rigby. We can use this abbreviation, Ibid, Ibidem, Latin meaning look at the footnote before or something like that. We can use Ibid. So and what Ibid says is look at exactly the reference before. So if we're in footnote five, you got to look at footnote four. And it's going to be exactly the same unless we change any information. In this instance, we've changed the page number uh, because footnote five references page 252 of Rigby, not page 250 to 251. Some uh, more thoughts on using Ibid. So here's a scenario that might come up for you. Uh, here I want to cite from, this is Abraham Lincoln, so I'm going to cite from the, the, um, uh, the, the collected works of Abraham Lincoln. It's a famous series of books known as Bassler, and for the editor, Roy Bassler. So here is what the source would look like in bibliographic form, right? Not note form, but bibliography. Lincoln, Abraham collected works. And so you can see that this is an edited collection of, Lincoln, of Lincoln's work. Lincoln is listed as the author, but uh, Bassler is the editor, so his name goes in this place. Also note that this is a nine-volume work. This is a multi-volume work. The bibli bibliographic form, it's just going to have this one entry for all nine volumes. But in your notes, you'll have to specify which volume you're using. So here's our note, and this is our first note. Uh, one is from Bassler. It gets the full citation because um, this is the first time we're referencing it. And note that our citation citation includes the title of the of the piece. So the big work is Bassler's Collected Works of Abraham Lincoln, but I am uh, referencing the document that I am using here, the specific mm -hmm. document. Note also that because this is a multi-volume work, I have to show in my note, my footnote, what um, volume I'm actually working with. So here I have to indicate that I'm using volume 2, colon, page 447. Now let's look uh, what happens when I add in my second footnote. So here is footnote number 1. Now I'm going to add footnote number 2 which is also going to be from Bassler. 
um, whoops, here it is. So now we have, uh, here's our second footnote, and we have a new volume number as well. What this note is saying is don't go to volume two of Bassler, go to volume three. And also note that we can use the short form of Bassler, which would just be Lincoln Collected Works, uh, because it is a subsequent citation. We could even use um, IBID, so it would look like in IBID, comma, 3, colon, 58. So let's take a, a look and see what this would look like. In practice, there are our endnotes 1 and 2. You can see that um, that 2, that's what it would look like if it was just IBID. And you see we can do that because we are referencing the exact same work that was referenced in the previous note. Okay, let's um, take some time to look at a few more complicated citation uh, methods. Um, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time looking at the different forms here. Um, there are myriad. There are many of them. That is why you have your manuals. So the Turabian guide will give you a, uh, a good sense of these different forms. It is your Bible. Uh, and you can see it how it might have all these different kinds for for multiple authors, editor or translator instead of author, chapter or other part of a book. Um, these are all forms that will come up, but it's um, not a good use of this time for me to go over them one by one. What I'm really suggesting here is that you have to master the basic formulas and then the more complicated ones will get a little bit easier. But in all instances, you want to be following your models. Let's uh, take a quick look at Chicago Turabian bibliographies. So uh, unless specified otherwise, you should um, include a bibliography at the end of your paper. Note that a bibliography is different from a works cited page. A works cited page includes only the works that you have created notes for. A bibliography includes all the sources that you consulted, not just those that you cited. You're going to start a bibliography on a new uh, page. You're going to put that title bibliography at the top of the page in the center. The uh, page number for the first page of the bibliography, like the first page of your notes, end notes section, like the first page of your paper, goes center bottom. Um, on all other pages, the correct format is top right. This is something you'll need to get your software to do. Uh, as normal, you're just going to use that Times Roman 12, whatever the same font is you used for the rest of your paper. And you're going to list your sources alphabetically by author's last name. And within that, from oldest to newest. So you sort them by date. So if you have John Smith or Jane Smith has written eight books that you're citing, you would organize them in date order from oldest to newest, uh, date of original publication. Entries themselves should be single spaced and double spaced between entries. And remember your hanging and dense. Remember the way the, um, uh, those, uh, how, to, how to make that indent look the way it should. And remember, too, that uh, larger bibliographies, like if you're writing one for a semester-long paper, might be divided into sections. So the, uh, you might divide primaries and secondaries. And within that, you could divide secondaries into journal articles, books, and dissertations. Within primaries, you might have one for archives and manuscripts, another for newspapers, um, things, li uh, things like that. Here's a small section of a bibliography just to kind of give you a sense of what this can look like. You've got all our citations are set up here. They're arranged in alphabetical order. Everything is spaced right. Benjamin Quarles has uh, two sources listed here, one from 1938 that's listed for first and another from 1976. Because of that, his name doesn't appear in that second citation. What that is is three M dashes. So try to make your word processing program produce something like that. Um, six hyphens, or I think it would actually be nine hyphens for an M dash. 
uh, would probably suffice here as well. It's not the easiest thing to make your software do. Okay, let's think about citing from online sources for a second. This is a little bit more complicated. Sometimes the standards change around this. These are all sort of newer citation formats. The technology changes around this. So I'm a little bit more tentative here. Make sure that you understand your individual instructor's requirements on this. Uh, let's take a, a, a common example, um, a journal article from an online database. Um, very often colleges and universities subscribe to online databases such as JSTOR or Project Muse. That's where this one is from. And what you get with those online journals, those high quality products are either actual page images or original pagination. So you're essentially looking at a, a, a digital version of a paper journal. You can reference it in your notes um, without any particular special reference to the database that you got it from. So here, this is from Project Muse. We do not need to add a kind of URL here uh, in, the, in the note. In the bibliography, though, we, uh, we are going to include that reference. We're going to use a stable URL if one is available. Please try not to include some horrendously long URL that has CGI information or well, there's all kinds of other technical gobbledygook. Try to keep it uh, simple and clear. Some of the more complicated forms or more uh, exotic forms, we start getting into things like blogs. There's more and more professional scholarship being done in blog form. And so this is what the form for a blog entry would look like in your note. This is how it would appear in uh, your bibliography. Let's uh, take a look at what a website looks like. So this is uh, something from um, Copernicus uh, that is taken from Bartleby.com, which is a, a fairly standard, reputable uh, source site, uh, site. And this is what the bibliographic form would look like. You can take a look at that. You can pause it. Again, these are all things that you can find in your uh, Turabian. I'm just showing you some of the common electronic ones. Here is the form for an ebook in note form and the bibliography form. And that pretty much does it for right now. There's a lot more that can be said on this, but I don't want to overwhelm you. Good luck with your papers.